it's interesting, when, when he left office, he'd cut inflation, jobs were growing again, the Dow Jones was back up, we were out of Vietnam, but what's the one thing he's remembered for? Pardon. The pardon of Richard Nixon. And uh, that's, that's probably the one thing that his presidency will always be remembered for. It's a decision he would never change. Cost him an election against Jimmy Carter. They figure the pardon cost him 10 to 15 percent of the vote in 1976 against Carter. They lost by, what, 1 percent. So the, the pardon definitely uh, probably ended his political career, but he never would have changed his mind. A uh, little background on the pardon. Um, after he became president, he called in the leaders of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, called them to the White House, asked them what was going on. They said, Mr. President, we have a war in Vietnam. We have a Cold War with the Russians. We have runaway inflation, you know, uh, unemployment. Uh, and we're still spending 25% of our every day in Congress dealing with Richard Nixon. Because there were still criminal charges pending against Richard <laughs> Nixon, even though he had resigned. And Dad was spending 25% of his every day in the White House dealing with Richard Nixon. And he felt very strongly the country needed to move on to get with the, the, what, what was going on with the war, the recession, the important things. He called in Leon Jaworski, the special prosecutor, and asked him how long Nixon could maybe drag this out in the court system. And the answer was, you know, three, four, maybe five years. And I think that's what made Dad's decision about he had to get Nixon out of the way so the country could move forward. And they came up with the idea of the pardon. And I, at that time, they knew they, they weren't going to be able to get Nixon to say he did anything wrong. That was not going to happen. Obviously, he came out in his books later and admitted to those things. Um, but they based their pardon on a um, Supreme Court case back in 1933, the Burdick case, where a man had been held in federal custody his name was Mr. Burdick, and the federal government had come to him and said, we'll give you a pardon if you'll testify for us in a case. He refused the pardon because the Supreme Court had ruled that by granting a pardon, it was an implication of guilt. And if you accepted a pardon, it was an acceptance of that guilt. Mr. Burdick turned the pardon down. It was called the Burdick case. They went to Nixon, and they said, we're going to grant the pardon on this basis. It's, by granting it, it's an implication of guilt. If you accept it, you accept that guilt. Nixon initially turned it down, uh, would not take it under those terms. Uh, this negotiations went on for two or three days. Uh, finally, Nixon came back, said he would accept it under those terms. And the uh, pardon was given, you know, basically ended Dad's political career. But uh, it did get Nixon out of the way so the Congress and the President could work on the most important things that were dragging the country down at that time, the war in Vietnam, the Cold War, the recession. It, it came full circle, though, because um, I'm guessing, what, 15 years ago, maybe, he was invited back to the John F. Kennedy Museum and Library by Caroline Kennedy and Senator Ted Kennedy and received the John F. Kennedy Award for courage in public service because of the Nixon pardon. <laughs> And trust me, I don't think he ever thought he'd be standing on the same podium with Senator Ted Kennedy and Kennedy, Senator Kennedy handing him a, an award for the pardon. Because, you know, Senator Ted Kennedy basically, back when Dad granted the pardon, said, you know, he'd sold the country out by pardoning Richard Nixon. But it came full circle. And uh, a lot of people saw that that was a courageous thing to do at the time. The um, selfless thing. I, you know, he, he, it didn't help his political career, but eventually it helped the country heal. And uh, so that was very, very unique. I don't think Dad ever thought he was going to get that award. So, but it did work out in the end. So, you know, and I tell you that because we think so short term today, short term, short term. Nobody thinks long term anymore. It's short term fixes now, now, now. You want result. Nobody thinks long term anymore. So, kind of an interesting story. Uh, I'll, I'll close with, with the most important thing I've learned since my, my father's passing. And um, I think it does have to do with character and leadership. I was about four months before my dad passed away. I was down in um, Beaumont, Texas in a federal prison. 
And uh, I, I wasn't in the prison. You realize that, right? <laughs> I was down there. Uh, I, was doing, I was doing what those three people asked me to do. I was being of service. And I was speaking to uh, about 200 inmates in that federal prison. And I, I was telling them, these were 200 men that were trying to get off drugs and alcohols and you know, transform their lives. And, and I was in there telling them my story and what the grace of God had done in my life to get sober. And, and uh, spoke to the man and told some stories and what my journey was to, to get sober. And, and then we did a question and answer thing afterwards. And, and a lot of guys got up and asked questions and stuff like that. And, and this one young man stood up and, and they were asking, wanted a question about dad's career, his accomplishments. And I thought about it, and this was about four months before dad passed away. And, and I said, you know, I, my dad is not in the best of health right now, and I don't, I don't know how long he's going to live. Could be two months, could be six months, could be a year. But I said, you know what, at, at, at some point, I'm going to be standing on the Capitol steps in Washington, D.C. at a state funeral. And I said, I promise you that when I'm standing there, the greatest value of my father's life at that moment is not going to be what he did in his career, uh, of how he got all the troops out of Vietnam, or how he cut inflation from 14.5% down to 4.2%. Or That's not going to be the greatest value. I said the most important thing is going to be how he led our family, what kind of father he was, what kind of leader of our family he was. And that, so we got in this discussion, that young man said, well, tell, you know, tell us a great story about his character, not his career, his character, who he was. And I thought about it, and there a lot of stories ran through my head, but the, the favorite story of mine that I think sums up who dad was, and it was at a very young age, so it had nothing to do with trying to plan out a political career or a, a, a move of that type. It was when he was a young man. And it's a story about what happened when he was at the University of Michigan playing football. And this is a story I shared with those, those 200 men in Beaumont, Texas in that federal prison. Same story I'll tell you today. Uh, we went back about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer. They retired my dad's jersey at, at University of Michigan. Whole family went. We stood on the field that day. I'll never forget it. They were playing Michigan State. And they retired dad's jersey. And this was when Michigan was still winning games. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and we, we stood there. They retired dad's jersey. I, you know, he had tears in his eyes and everything. It was a wonderful day. And, and um, there was a, a guy pulled me aside and said, I want to tell you a story about your father's life. And he says, your dad and I, you know, I knew your dad when he was playing football at Michigan in 1932, 33, and 34. And uh, he says, 1932 and 33, I think Michigan was undefeated both years, 10 and 0, national champions, right? And he told me the story. He says, in 1934, your dad um, uh, was a captain of the team, most valuable player, one or the other. I forget which one it was. And it, in 1934, Michigan was going to play a team, Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech was an all-white school. And Michigan, I mean, Georgia Tech found out that Michigan had one black player on its team. I think his number was number 61, Willis Ward. And Willis Ward was a star of the Michigan football team. And Georgia Tech, in 1934, said, we will not take the field. We won't play the game this weekend if Willis Ward suits up for that game. Now, first of all, this isn't a story about Georgia Tech because there were plenty of other universities and colleges at that time in 1934 that were doing the same thing as Georgia Tech. This is, you know, that was the norm. The man who was telling me the story said, your father <clears throat> was so incensed. He thought that was so wrong that his good friend Willis Ward could not play in that game that he was going to quit the University of Michigan football team to make a stand for his friend Willis Ward. And your father wrote his father back here in, in, in Grand Rapids and, and wrote him a letter and said, Dad, I'm going to quit the University of Michigan football team because my good friend Willis Ward can't play in this game. And, and I guess Willis Ward heard about it. He was touched by it. He went to my dad, told him, look, Jerry, you've got to play the game. I'll sit down. Convinced my dad to go back on the team. <clears throat> 